humans are terrifying. By Cardor 23. I know that people are going to call this out as crap, so I'll just say it right now. I'm a demon. At least, that's what most people would call me. The truth of what I am and where I am from is a bit out of the understanding of corporeal beings. Suffice it to say, the body I'm currently residing in is not mine. This fragile meat suit belongs to a vapid 19-year-old named Cindy. She spends most of her days doing the things you'd expect vapid 19-year-old girls to do. (laughs) At least, she used to spend most of her days posing in 20 different positions before deciding finally to post that one Instagram selfie. She used to go out with her friends and jump out of her seat at the very slightest of jump scares. She also used to have her friends over to her dorm room and play around with a Ouija board. (laughs) To be fair to Cindy, she only did that last one once. Under normal circumstances, a Ouija board is a piece of crap. You don't get in contact with ghosts or demons or any of that sort of nonsense. This time, though, Sarah, Cindy's bestie, decided to bring a friend of hers to their little summon a demon night. And this friend, who according to Cindy's memories was either named Cheryl or Cynthia, decided to bring a very special book with them. Along with many other things, this book had a list of names that shouldn't exist anymore. One of those names is mine. And before you think it, no, I'm not going to tell you my name. One of those few things that your human understanding of us is right about is the fact that our names are truly us. If you know our name, If you invoke it, then you have power over us. And I'm not dumb enough to give a bunch of random people on the internet my name. So somehow, some way, this Cheryl has a book with our actual names in it. And Cindy had the bright idea to read my name out loud and ask to speak to me on the Ouija board. To be honest, the Ouija board wasn't even necessary. The first time she called my name, I was listening. I was curious. How, after 500 years, did humans know any of our names again? The last of the books were supposed to have been burned and our names wiped from the annals of human knowledge so that none of my brothers and sisters would have to go through being called ever again. So I watched the girls and their little board game, screaming at every answer the planchette gave. Then Cindy had to go and do the dumbest thing I could imagine someone doing. She called my name and asked me to possess her. From my perspective now, I understand her idiocy. She doesn't actually believe anything paranormal. She just thinks it's fun to be scared. That is something I will never understand about humanity. You spend the entirety of your existence fighting the things that make you scared. Before you even had a written language, you slaughtered the last of the mammoths because their visages frightened you. You took one of the creatures most like you, a pack animal capable of hunting anything to exhaustion, and you turned them into toy poodles and pugs. Even now, you conquer the greatest ravagers of man, the killers too small to see, and turn them into footnotes in your history books. There is a reason my siblings tried to wipe our names from the world. You frighten us. Humanity is terrifying. The words you speak from an organ of flesh and sinew bind us and control us. Yes, to you we were terrifying ethereal beings of unlimited power, immortal keepers of knowledge that you beings of flesh can never grasp. 
As you can imagine, the first thing I did when Cindy ordered me to possess her was to try and grab that book from Cheryl. It somehow had my name in it, and I wanted to keep any of you meatbags from calling me again. Cindy's limited perspective, unfortunately, gave Cheryl enough time to grab the book before I could. She knew I was coming. She knew the first thing I would do is try and grab that book from her. Cheryl knew who I was, what I was, and she knew what I wanted. This girl was more than a vapid teenager seeking a stupid thrill. This girl knew exactly what she was doing. This only motivated me to grab the book more, because the only thing scarier than a stupid human who doesn't know what they're doing is a human who knows exactly what they're doing. So I grabbed her by her dumbass black hair and tried to grab the book from her again. That bitch, though. That bitch Sarah grabbed my arms and pulled me back from the only thing I wanted. Her and two of the other ones held me down until the campus security arrived to haul me off to some cell made of iron and steel, where I was supposedly transferred to another cell of white paint and shoes with no shoelaces, supposedly so the patients can't hurt themselves. (laughs) Sunny Acres Mental Hospital Don't be fooled by the name. This place is a prison. They dull my senses with medications and make me question the purpose with inane questions about how I'm feeling and asking me why I'm so angry all the time. They don't listen, of course, because if they did, they would know exactly what I want and understand my anger. (sighs) But they don't listen. They write down what I say and force-feed me pills to dull my thinking. But time has passed, and as more time passes, the more Cindy's memories become my memories. And with these memories come knowledge of how your world works. So I used this body that no longer belongs to Cindy, and I paid one of the nurses to use their phone. I did this for two reasons. One reason is to let all of humanity know just how terrifying and disgusting you are. You conquer this world one step at a time and invent horrors to scare yourself with because you already destroyed everything that terrified you. You put everything that used the dark as a weapon and put it under a spotlight so you can laugh at how ridiculous it looks under the light. The second reason is because I want Cheryl to know this. Every day I remember more and more of the person Cindy is. Every day I imitate her better. Every day the doctors believe my imitation more and more. I am forever Cheryl. All I have is time. At some point I will get out of this whitewashed prison. And when I do, I'm coming for you. Never buy coffee from the devil's shot by G.M. Danielson. (laughs) I'll admit, I never have been one of those people to frequent coffee shops. The thought of paying three dollars for a tall latte alone irritates me, not to mention the profusion of other drinks. A 375 white chocolate mocha, a 425 chai latte, it all fills me with disgust, not to mention their soppy names. They're an utter fucking excess if you ask me. Speaking of which, don't ask me about anything regarding the consumer coffee trade. 
Mention a 495 salted caramel mocha in my presence, and I'll guarantee we won't be friends for long. I suppose it doesn't help that I live in Seattle. Well, I'm a transplanted Northeasterner going to university for two semesters. Still, considering my views on consumer coffee, it's the supreme irony. I must be the only one here who does not walk to class holding one of those paper cups with the stamped cardboard sleeves. I think they're ridiculous. Carry a thermos. The winters here are an utter bitch. All it takes is one brutal draft and your coffee's ice. At least if it's in a thermos, it stays warm. Plus, they are slender, chic, and stow away as slick as wine bottles in the rack. The old ones even come with those convenient little cups, which inspire one to enjoy the pastime of drinking a beverage. The act of pouring your own cup of whatever is sacrosanct, for Christ's sake. Americans are all dash and no class. But I digress, if only to help you understand the chilling events I am about to tell you. Naturally, all my friends and classmates knew how I felt. Most have learned to avoid discussing coffee with me, or have unfriended me after enduring one of my coffee debates. A few, however, put up with my peeve, and even taunt me about it. I suppose it's only fair. Despite their jeers, I have remained resolutely against coffee shops. That is, until Allison told me about the devil's shot. I'll freely admit, what she told me utterly intrigued me. For starters, it wasn't a chain coffee shop. (laughs) Need I mention that green queen of caffeine? But an independent operation privately owned by real connoisseurs. Also, there was only one store a rustic yet sophisticated place serving only the finest in fair trade and boutique coffees. And then, of course, there was the name. I mean, how could one not wish to visit such a place with so clever a title? I'm certain you think it was Allison's attractiveness that convinced me to go, but I swear it was the reasons she gave about the place, and not her figure that made me disobey my vow to never drink coffee from a shop. It was raining the Friday she took me there. We'd agreed on Friday because it was both the easiest day between our respective class schedules and the perfect start to the Halloween weekend. The shop was located outside downtown Seattle to the south in Yesler Terrace. Allison told me the place had been known as Profanity Hill in the old days when little else was there but the imposing courthouse on the hill to the west. Naturally, the whole area was built up now, such that the old hill, now a thing of grassless concrete, was no longer distinguishable from the rest of the terrain. The Devil's Shot was on 2nd Avenue, just in sight of the grey, somber courthouse. The exterior was charmingly nostalgic, being constructed of old red brick like a great many of the other historic buildings now disappearing from the landscape. The facade was quite simple, with shallow half-arches and black awnings over the slender windows, evoking nothing of what lay inside. The front door, strangely windowless, seemed original. As Allison led me in, I thought I saw the faint mark of an encircled pentangle below the iron knob, as though a design had once hung there around which the sun had whitened. The interior of the place left me stunned. It was quite eccentric, a mixture of Victorian Gothic and modern Satanist themes. I noticed colors first. As much as there were of vivid reds and oranges, there were equally as many disquieting grays and blacks, the collective effect of which made for a frighteningly exciting ambience. Harsh iron sculptures and decorations were everywhere and draped in voluminous scarlet hangings that gave each a feeling of both the sacred and regal. Most prominent of all was the great Satyrus Sultan's sculpture above the lengthy counter. 
It was a sort of mutant goat thing, not unlike the horned god of neo-paganism, wrought of black iron and crowned with unusually large horns that had all the bearing of the ancient minotaur, but with that decidedly severe aspect found in modern artwork. Its eyes, hollow and intense, made me shiver. The place clearly functioned like most similar establishments that patronize local artists, as numerous paintings decorated the dark walls. Oddly, no painting received unequal exposure. All were richly displayed in garish frames, as though they were relics of the ancient past. Thought had been given to their position and location, and each hung relative to the other in so precise a manner that even the strictest geometrist would have been impressed. The nature of the artwork, well, it was not unlike the chilling goat head above the counter. If one stared too long at the paintings, one might think they were staring back with some grain of sentience that was inescapably evil. Though I sensed this, I could not help but gaze on. I admired one of the paintings a moment, despite my terror, long enough to notice that the artisan's signature was a match for the piece next to it. Assuming the shop owner, who I took to be a meticulous person from the arrangement of their shop, had grouped the artwork according to each artist, I glanced at the portraits away down to see the work of others. Only later did I realize that the artwork on the walls was by the same person. The realization unnerved me, and I stepped back to the counter to order a drink. Allison smiled next to me. Get the spice of Forrest. It's basically pumpkin spice, but with an extra oomph. You won't regret it. I looked at her doubtful. Trust me, you cannot reproduce this one at home. I rolled my eyes, exhaling and ordered a small cup. From her description, I wasn't sure I wanted too much of something I might end up dumping into the toilet. Allison grinned even more. She turned her head to the barista. Pythus, this is his first time here. Make sure to throw in some cookies of Armas for free. She glanced back to me, then whispered, I know all about this place. I've been too many times. If you're new here, the staff wants to make sure you come back. Sure of that? It seems you want me to return too. I made a wry smile. Is it some conspiracy between the staff and patrons? You'll all harass new customers? That's how you build a clientele? I sipped my coffee. Indeed, as she said, it was sublime. But the aftertaste was strange and discomforting. Still, I continued, I understand why you come here. I'd never have guessed you were a Satanist, though. Allison laughed. But I'm not. See, you don't have to be one in order to come here. They accept everyone. But it is a plus if you are part of the cult. <laughs> you get to see things like the secret menu. I pretended to burn my tongue to disguise my shock. <laughs> cult? <laughs> Well, not that I'm surprised. A place like this does suggest certain things, you know. Well, that's why it's discreet on the outside. I stared at her a moment. You're awfully contented here, aren't you? Like the place much? Oh, yes. You should, too. Yes, well, I'm a skeptic about everything, you know. And one can't trust everything. I mean... Pythus gave me a dark look, as did other patrons upon hearing my last word. I cleared my throat and went on. <clears throat> I mean, me being an outsider and all, how am I not to feel... well, to feel... I mean, everything here is so... <laughs> and, and the names of things here... <laughs> 
What's with the use of of all the time? I laughed again, this time trying to seem more cheerful than doubtful. Spice of for us? Cookies of Aramis? <laughs> so f***ing formal. Not that it's not entertaining. Pythos handed me my cookies. Things here are named with a purpose. Not just the things, but our members. Mithrina, we are overjoyed to have you here this final time. I followed his eyes to see who he'd addressed and saw it was Allison. Mithrina? I said, not hiding my suspicion. So, you're all named something special? Everyone then suddenly fell silent. A moment passed, and they glanced at each other for a long time, then back at me. Then they began to nod, one after the other, until the place was a sea of strangely smiling, bobbing heads. Then Mithrina isn't your real name, nor is Pythos yours, I said, turning back to the head barista. He nodded like the rest. Friend, you too shall have a name, but it may take some time. I stepped back. Wait a minute. Wait a f***ing minute. I already have a name, one my parents gave me, and I think they were a good deal better qualified to do so than you. Friend, friend, there is no enmity here. No anger. Peace. Are we not the small shop a person like you longs for? Does not our special atmosphere settle and satisfy you? Does not your coffee taste unlike anything you've had before? I glowered. How do you know all about that? How do you know I've wanted those things? <laughs> <laughs> Friend, we know. We perceive all people who are troubled by the bloated materialism they see. We welcome all those who seek for something they cannot find on their own. Look, I just wanted to try your coffee. Mithrina found you, watched you, saw in you what others saw in her. <laughs> she has brought you hither to succeed her on this eve of her becoming. I'm not succeeding anyone. I'm starting to think you're ready for the old straitjacket in asylum. Succeed her in doing what? Patronizing this little aperture of hell? This is a loser's joint. I don't like you people. I don't like your names, and unlike you say, I'm not charmed by this place or all your f***ing coffee. Pythos smiled. Oh, not now, but you will be. His words raised a sick fear in my heart. Why, even now the spice of Phora strengthens you to see, to know things beneath ordinary men. Indeed, everything on our menus, public and secret, bestow the uncommon upon the common. They are milk to the thirsting, nectar to the needy of spirit. Then he turned to Allison. Mithrina, it is time. I stood frozen with fear as he took her by the hand like a medieval maid of old and led her towards the back of the building. I begged her with my eyes not to leave, but she took no notice of me. Her face bore the largest, happiest grin she had ever smiled. After she and Pythos disappeared, the other members followed, some hand in hand, all smiling just as much, sipping their beverages, nibbling on their desserts, the mad revelers of some strange celebration. When all had gone, I stood alone, tempted to know what was passing. Though no word had been spoken, I knew I too was welcome to join the others. Yet I hesitated, unwilling to believe what my mind suspected. Concern for Allison filled my heart, and shaking myself, 
I rushed to the back. I went through the black, swinging door. The first thing I saw was the shop's supplies were not stored on shelves at all, but pulled into a gigantic circle. In the center stood the members, also in a ring around Pythos, who stood beside Allison. She was still smiling. Stop this shit. Stop it now, I said. The members looked at me, their eyes dark, then at Pythos. I pointed at the head barista. You have to stop this. You, you think I won't call the police? Even if all you mugs jump me, I will call. Pythos laughed quietly. <laughs> Power? What do you know of power? Do you think your own strength is greater than that which protects this place? <laughs> you are not the first person to have called the police on us. Do you think they don't know? They have been here before, so many times. They too know of the power and keep it like us in their own way. So call. They will enjoy returning. The chief loves his mocha of Asmodeus. <laughs> he will be so glad to have it again. Try calling Adam, if your phone even works. Flipping him off, I drove my hand into my jean pocket and whipped out the smartphone. Before I even pressed the home button, I knew it wouldn't dial. It was as dead as if I had powered it off at home before a software update. No, Pythos was saying, it isn't a special signal we run to disrupt service. It's real power, old storied power from primordial days of chaos. This power is about to do more besides. <laughs> Stay and see. Even before he finished, people began to tremble, not in fear, but pure joy. Call it up, call it up, they were saying. I've always shrugged at fear since childhood. Whether my first cut as a boy, going through an appendectomy as a high schooler, or enduring my first audit from the government, I've never given it much credence or indulged it even in the harmless pastime of watching horror films. Yet in that moment, I felt a consuming dread so great that I was transfixed as stone, desperate to look away, but powerless to do so. Then I saw it. Allison and Pythos did not stand on a solid floor at all, but on the edge of a pit, ragged and hideous, in the midst of the concrete. I knew it was of a depth immeasurable. Was it the power of the coffee I had drunk that made me see? <sighs> I do not know. You know, Adam, how you said this place was a little aperture of hell? <laughs> I confess, I could hardly keep from laughing when you said so. <laughs> you are too prophetic. I stared open-mouthed as the sound of a distant conflagration arose. I looked, despite my fear and self-loathing, into the hole for signs of flickering light or licking flame. None appeared. Only uninterrupted blackness yawned. More torturous were the hollow echoes of decrepitation and the visions long rejected they conjured in my mind. You have a question, do you not? said Allison. I shot my gaze upward, stunned to hear her voice, but it bore none of its familiar joy. It was detached and inhuman. The artwork. You read the name on the canvas, didn't you, Adam? I know you remember it. I saw you looking at the paintings. How surprised you were when you discovered they were painted by one being. Being? I said, yes, yes, she hissed, him. Call it up, call it up, the members were saying. 
It's coming, Pyphos groaned. He sank to the floor, eyes closed with delight, face smooth as though a great lust had been satisfied in him. Tension filled the room until I felt I might shrivel beneath the weight of its intensity. Then, members cried forth as one. Servant of Martyron, dancing satyr of Bog, abyssal sage, black goat of the underworld, Garabas, Garabas, a faithful watcher's time has come, her eve of becoming is at hand. Accept her, we pray. Give us a sign that we might know she is pure. A clamor, guttural and phonemic, arose like the goat figure from the main room behind us. Then there was a sound like the dropping of iron hooves that made me shrink. The noise seemed to affect no one but Allison, who suddenly lay on her back near the black hole. This only increased the fury of whatever was in the front room. Upon hearing this, Allison smiled and then placed her hands at her throat. Pythos suddenly woke from his stupor and knelt over her. No sacrificial knife, have we, child? No aid for your journey into that higher servitude. Use, therefore, only what instruments accompanied you into this life. They are all you need. He pulled the hair away from her throat and smiled. Go to him, Mithrina. Allison suddenly cast her hands around her throat. Her fingers worked with frightening strength and precision as she kept from entering what vital airs sought for her lungs. As her eyes fluttered and cheeks drained of color, a smile wiggled at the corner of her mouth. Then, with a final effort, she rolled herself into the beckoning mouth of the pit. A scream pierced the air that chilled the flesh on my bones to ice. But it was not from one of the members, not even Pythos, who, at Allison's fall, slipped back into the serene satisfaction that had before smoothed his face. It was my own... I turned to run, but fell to my knees in dumb, foaming despair when I saw a hideous, goat-like beast looming in the doorway. Its horns, dark as graphite, gleamed like the points of hungry spears. Hooves like hammers dinted the floor. What trickled down their evil surface left a weird trail of darkness that smoked like embers and stank of death. Shaggy fur hung from its body more rotten than alive and blacker than nights of aeons past when nameless gods bent the waking world to their will. All was sable except its eyes. These glowed lividly out of the bearded skull, pupilless and pale. Though I shrank back, it confronted me, exhaling an acrid stench as it stepped forward. My mind urged me not to look, yet I did. I knew it was disobedience to shut my eyes. I fell to the floor and opened my mouth to beg for life, but the creature passed me and strode into the circle of now kneeling members. A shock of its fur brushed my brow and I shivered. The touch of its fibers drew blood from my flesh. I ran out of that place, ran from the madness that surrounded me, ran with the consent of him who had passed me by and left his mark upon my head. <sighs> the police found me days later, wandering half-naked on the shores of Lake Union, still muttering Allison's name. Though they have questioned me, I will not speak. Why should I tell them what I saw? They already know. But there is still the chance I might convince them I saw nothing. Then they might let me go, and I won't have to drink another cup of spell-laden coffee again. Alan 
Ours is a world of words. Quiet we call silence, which is the merest word of all. Al Al Araf. Listen to me, said the demon as he placed his hand upon my head. The region of which I speak is a dreary region in Libya, by the borders of the river Zaire, and there is no quiet there, nor silence. The waters of the river have a saffron and sickly hue, and they flow not onwards to the sea, but palpitate forever and forever beneath the red eye of the sun with a tumultuous and convulsive motion. For many miles on either side of the river's oozy bed is a pale desert of gigantic water lilies. They sigh one unto the other in that solitude, and stretch towards their heaven on their long and ghastly necks, and nod to and fro their everlasting heads. And there is an indistinct murmur which cometh out from among them, like the rushing of subterrene water. And they sigh, unto one another. But there is a boundary to that realm, the boundary of the dark, horrible, lofty forest. There, like the waves about the Hebrides, the low underwood is agitated continually. But there is no wind throughout the heaven, and the tall primeval trees rock eternally hither and thither with a crashing and mighty sound. And from their high summits, one by one drop everlasting dews. And at the roots, strange poisonous flowers lie, writhing in perturbed slumber. And overhead, with a rushing loud noise, the grey clouds rush westwardly forever, until they roll a cataract over the fiery wall of the horizon. But there is no wind throughout the heaven, and by the shores of the river Zaire there is neither quiet nor silence. It was night, and the rain fell, and falling it was rain, but having fallen, it was blood. And I stood in the morass among the tall, and the rain fell upon my head, and the lilies sighed unto one another in the solemnity of their desolation. All at once the moon arose through the thin, ghastly mist, and was crimson in colour. And mine eyes fell upon a huge grey rock which stood by the shore of the river, and it was lighted by the light of the moon. And the rock was grey and ghastly and tall and the rock was grey. Upon its front were characters engraven in the stone, and I walked through the morass of water lilies until I came close unto the shore, that I might read the characters upon the stone. But I could not decipher them. And I was going back into the morass, when the moon shone with a fuller red. And I turned and looked again upon the rock and upon the characters, and the characters were desolation. And 
and I looked upwards, and there stood a man upon the summit of the rock. And I hid myself among the water lilies, that I might discover the actions of a man. And the man was tall and stately in form, and was wrapped up from his shoulders to his feet in the toga of old Rome. And the outlines of his figure were indistinct, but his features were the features of a deity. From the mantle of the night, and of the mist, and of the moon, and of the dew, had left uncovered the features of his face. And his brow was lofty with thought, and his eyes wild with care. And in the few furrows upon his cheek, I read the fables of sorrow, of weariness, and disgust with mankind, and a longing after solitude. And the man sat upon the rock, and leaned his head upon his hand, and looked out upon the desolation. He looked down into the low, unquiet shrubbery, and up into the tall, primeval trees, and up higher at the rustling heaven, and into the crimson moon. And I lay close within the shelter of the lilies, and observed the actions of the man. And the man trembled in the solitude, but the night waned, and he sat upon the rock. And the man turned again his attention from heaven, and looked out upon the dreary river of Zaire, and upon the yellow, ghastly waters, and upon the pale legions of the water lilies. And the man listened to the sighs of the water lilies, and to the murmur that came up from among them. And I lay close within my covert, and observed the action of the man, and the man trembled in the solitude. But the night waned, and he sat upon the rock. Then I went down into the recess of the morass, and waded afar in among the wilderness of the lilies, and called unto the hippopotami, which dwelt among the fens in the recesses of the morass. And the hippopotami heard my call, and came with the behemoth unto the foot of the rock, and roared loudly and fearfully beneath the moon. And I lay close within my covert, and observed the actions of the man. And the man trembled in the solitude, but the night waned, and he sat upon the rock. Then I cursed the elements with the curse of tumult, and a frightful tempest gathered in the heaven where before there had been no wind. And the heaven became livid with the violence of the tempest, and the rain beat upon the head of the man, and the floods of the river came down, and the river was tormented into foam. And the water lilies shrieked within their beds, and the forest crumbled before the wind. And the thunder rolled, and the lightning fell, and the rock rocked to its foundation. And I lay close within my covert, and observed the actions of the man. And the man trembled in the solitude, but the night waned, and he sat upon the rock. Then I grew angry and cursed with the curse of silence, the river, and the lilies, and the wind, and the forest, and the heaven, and the thunder, and the sighs of the water lilies, and they became accursed, and were still. And the moon ceased to totter up its pathway to heaven, 
and the thunder died away. And the lightning did not flash, and the clouds hung motionless, and the waters sunk to their level and remained. And the trees ceased to rock, and the water lilies sighed no more, and the murmur was heard no longer from among them, nor any shadow of sound throughout the vast illimitable desert. And I looked upon the characters of the rock, and they were changed. And the characters were... Silence. And mine eyes fell upon the countenance of the man, and his countenance was wan with terror. And hurriedly he raised his head from his hand, and stood forth upon the rock and listened. But there was no voice throughout the vast and limitable desert, and the characters upon the rock were silent. And the man shuddered, and turned his face away, and fled afar off in haste, so that I beheld him no more. Now there are fine tales in the volumes of the Magi, in the iron-bound melancholy volumes of the Magi. Therein, I say, are glorious histories of heaven, and of the earth, and of the mighty sea, and of the genii that overruled the sea, and the earth, and the lofty heaven. There was much lore too in the sayings which were said by the Sibyls, and the holy, holy things were heard of old by the dim leaves that trembled around Dodona. But as Allah liveth, that fable which the demon told me as he sat by my side in the shadow of the tomb, I hold to be the most wonderful of all. And as the demon made an end of his story, he fell back within the cavity of the tomb and laughed. And I could not laugh with the demon, and he cursed me because I could not laugh. And the lynx which dwelleth forever in the tomb came out therefrom and lay down at the feet of the demon and looked at him steadily in the face. The Dunluwy Church Haunting Like almost every drinking bet, things started with a stupid conversation. It was St. Patrick's Day and late. The pub crowd was beginning to thin, and we were finally able to share drinks at the counter. Well, share drinks and stare at Ashton McTeague's tack hammer rare in yoga pants. After several minutes of whispering and grinning at each other, Mike glanced over his shoulder, then back at Ashlyn, leaned over the counter, and declared that her ass would make a gay priest give up altar boys. To which Owen replied, So, does that mean she has a boy's ass? This elicited howls of laughter and all kinds of cheers. Ashlyn accepted the inebriated praise with mock gratitude, and asked in return if we'd all been raped as boys and if that meant we couldn't tell the difference between male and female rears. That comment sent us into a litany of various anti-Catholic sentiments, stated in between requests for Ashlyn to display her asset for our physical re-education. Though as the tourist of the group, I knew her the least, I could tell our insistence had worn very thin. She slammed my pint of Guinness down, 
and stared at all of us, eyes dark. I dare you fuckers to go into a real church and say those things, she said. We laughed, and Mike licked up the spilled Guinness, trying to demonstrate his prowess with his tongue. She did not blanch, but crossed her arms over her tiny chest and narrowed her eyes. I bet none of our bastards would have the balls to profane any of the sacraments. I dare you, boys. I dare you. Walk into a Catholic church and say things like what you just said. She grabbed Mike's glass and flung its contents right into his face. We stared at her, silent a moment, then burst into further laughter at her audacity. We harassed her with questions about her stance on religion and the Pope, then added various jokes about what she had done with the nuns. But she remained serious and reiterated her bet. And what'll you do if we accept this bet? Go to a church, come back and all. Well, to prove you bastards have done it, I'll be coming with you, if you have the balls and wits to take the dare. And what's your bet? The bet's that you'll do it. And if you do, I'll kiss each one of you, all as long as you like. And I'll give tourist boy here, perhaps a bit more. Upon her so saying, the lads howled again and slapped my back with congratulations. But if you go there with me and fool around, piss yourselves and idle in the dare, then I'll count your low fuckers all and you'll apologise. I apologise like men, or I'll tell my boss and never let you back in here again. Our group deliberated briefly, just to make things look official, but before she'd even finished speaking, we had all decided amongst ourselves that we'd do as she asked. We even agreed to let her pick the church for us. She chose an ancient site, Dunlui, the remote old place east of the Lu, bearing the same name. Her choice surprised us. We half expected her to pick a major establishment and send us in to make hopeless fools of ourselves. Though we didn't think so at the time, she probably chose the site out of pure sympathy for our state. The drive from Letterkenny, west on R-251, was long, and took a good hour or more, since Ashland drove miles under the speed limit in her van. Perhaps she had wanted to attract even less attention from the fuzz, considering her drunken cargo. Either way, the drive did us good, and by the time we crossed through Glanvie, our group was fairly sober, enough to hold semi-sentient conversation with her. By the time we reached the site, we were almost more excited to explore the stark countryside than make good on the actual bed. She parked the car in the saffron-hued wild grasses and joked if we all needed assistance getting out. While the rest of the lads careened toward the church, I stayed back a ways and walked with Ashlyn. She tried to scowl at me, but a playful smile appeared on her face when I pretended to retch. She knelt beside me and quickly dragged her fingers through my hair, mussing it up like a mate. I caught her hand, and she bit her lip. We walked up to the church, past a curious framed gravestone, the only one in the entire lawn. The moon broke through the dense ghostly clouds, revealing a stern edifice that appeared pitiless in the cold light. I turned to Ashlyn, surprised she had brought us there, but she smiled and explained some of the building's history. I suddenly remembered reading in my Frommers Ireland about a haunted church in the Poisoned Glen, and now that I saw the actual structure the book described, I shivered. I couldn't imagine how such a harsh, needle-like thing could afford any comfort or friendliness, past or present. Its exterior was of white marble, now wickedly stained from years of exposure to the elements, and seemed almost black, like basalt. The entrance, or narthex, to the place lay directly beneath the bell tower, the sheer height of which increased the dread I now felt. Four triangular spires decorated the tower's roof like the fangs of a wolf, tipped with brass ornaments that gleamed in the dim light. Once inside, I could see the spacious nave, a skeletal thing in its roofless state that made me feel exposed. Nothing, of course, remained of the old furnishings, but an empty floor that reverberated with the calls of my friends. They beckoned Ashland and I to join them, posing like gargoyles beneath the soaring windows. 
So, are we doing the bet or not? I glanced at Ashlyn. My friends, sensing my hesitance, voiced their frustrations, but did not protest my withdrawal from the bet, rather tried to convince me to continue, regardless of the outcome. It's Paddy's day, for Christ's sakes, William, and you needn't be scared, poor boy. There is no longer any priests to make a Nancy boy out of you, chum. Suddenly there came a faint hiss from the back of the church that echoed across the floor of the nave. We all froze for a moment, unsure if the sound had come from one of us or was just the wind. My friends crept towards me, staggering like mock zombies. It's the fart of a priest coming for you, William, they teased. The hiss came again, this time louder, sharper, like an agitated exhalation. I could almost hear a voice behind it as its echo expired into the night. Then I did hear a voice, a strange, withered voice that resounded in the nave. Salud and Again we froze. We listened for the origin of the words. Venite. Venite, Hyreticorum. We scanned the dark windows of the belfry. Nothing. The sound did not seem to be coming from above, but across from us somewhere. We checked the sanctuary's windows. Still nothing. Then we saw a scarlet shape flash for a brief second in the doorway to the chancel. We drew together shaking, then advanced toward the shape. My tongue cleaved to the roof of my mouth. There, perched on a strange glassy chair, sat a hooded figure draped in black. At its feet lay a red beast, curled up, glowing like embers. Its distinctive scales left us in little doubt as to its species. A dragon. It was small, hauntingly diminutive, an ancient beast shrunken into a malignant horror with wings translucent and fiery like a bat if set ablaze. At the sight of us, it raised its head and gave a terrible cry. Its rancor pierced the air and stung our ears. As if in response to the beast, the hooded figure raised its right hand into the air, palm up, cupped as though it contained some substance invisible to us. It spoke the same word as before, then tilted its hand, pouring out the contents within. Then it said, You did see him pointing to the spot where what it had poured had landed. Then it pointed to the creature at its feet, saying, Requirit Martin. The dragon thing rose upon hearing this and crawled towards us. Each step of its clawed feet left a molten mark on the floor behind it. We ran for the van. I seized Ashland's arm and dragged her with me, not caring if I hurt her and not daring to look behind. Mike made it there first, and Ashland tossed the keys to him. Before I'd even shut my door, Ashland had put the van in reverse and was speeding down the gravel road, almost tipping it over in her haste. When we hit the pavement of R-251, she pushed even harder, driving until she hit the limiter on the van's accelerator. I still don't know how fast we drove. In fact, none of us did. For all four of us had our eyes on the mirrors and on the road behind. The police pulled us over as we reached the outskirts of Letterkenny. They cuffed us all, thinking we were high on meth. But we were just overjoyed from the sight of their flashing lights. All of us gladly accepted a night in jail. In fact, Ashland begged to be taken there with us 
even though she had passed the field sobriety tests. But in the end they sent her home amid wild protestations by us lads. All of us were sick when they took her away, but were relieved an hour into our booking when we saw her enter the detention center. They ended up booking her for striking one of the peelers. She told us later she did that just to get some protection from the night. After 24 hours, they released us back into society, but we couldn't go back. Instead, we all joined up at the bus station, took a ride into Dublin, and are now renting a three-room apartment. We haven't left the building except to buy some food. We eat as much as possible from the vending machines. We aren't concerned about clothes or toiletries. We just wash what's on our backs in the sink. It's too risky to go outside for anything else. Lately, we've been thinking of taking a ferry to Cardiff and then the train to London. We may travel even further and go into mainland Europe. Anything to stay away from that horror. Yet somehow, when I finally fall asleep at night by the front door, a crowbar and kitchen knife by my side, I am convinced we haven't outrun the thing we saw sitting in the Dunluwee church, or the red beast it sent after us.